Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see so many people here already for our pre-concert talk. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the Music Division at the Library of Congress. And we're in for a real big treat, as always, uh, with our concert tonight, uh, but with uh, Gerald Finlay and Julius Drake um, and our pre-concert speaker, uh, Dr. Harlow Robinson. I'm just going to give a brief introduction of him, and then I'll let him uh, get the talk underway and tell us a bit more about what we're going to be uh, hearing tonight. <clears throat> Uh, Matthew's Distinguished University Professor, Dr. Haller Robinson, is a specialist in Soviet and Russian cultural history and has written widely on Soviet film and the performing arts. His major publications include Sergei Prokofiev, of a biography, which has appeared in five editions, The Last Impresario, The Lifetimes and Legacy of Sol Hurak, and Selected Letters of Sergei Prokofiev, which he edited and translated. Uh, his book, Russians in Hollywood, Hollywood's Russians, was published in 2007. He's also contributed numerous essays, articles, and reviews to the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The Nation, Opera News, Opera Quarterly, Dance, Playbill, Symphony, and other publications. As a lecturer, he's appeared at the Boston Symphony, New York Philharmonic, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Metropolitan Opera, Lincoln Center, Philadelphia Orchestra, Los Angeles Music Center Opera, Guggenheim Museum, San Francisco Symphony, the Rotterdam Philharmonic, uh, the Aspen Music Festival, and the Bard Festival. He has also worked as a consultant for numerous performing arts organizations and as a writer and commentator for PBS, NPR, and the Canadian Broadcasting System. Professor Robinson has served as Vice President of the American Association of Teachers of Slavic and East European Languages. He's a frequent, frequent visitor to the former USSR in Russia, he has received fellowships and grants from the NEH, American Council of Learned Societies, Fulbright, and the Whiting Foundation. Professor Robinson teaches courses on Russian cultural history, the history of Soviet cinema, the image of Russia in American culture, um, and Prague, Vienna, and Budapest from 1867 to 1918. In March of 2010, Professor Robinson was selected by the Academy of Motion Pictures of Arts and, Science, and Sciences as an Academy Film Scholar. As part of this prestigious honor, he received a grant from the Academy's Institutional Grants Committee to support his research on the career of Oscar-winning director Lewis Milestone. Uh, please join me in, in uh, welcoming Harlow Robinson. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, David, for inviting me. And, um, you know, I have worked at this wonderful library in the past. In fact, it was very important to me when I was writing my two books on Sergei Prokofiev, both the biography and the collection of letters that I did later on, uh, because here at the, in the music division, uh, there's quite a lot of Prokofiev material. And in fact, uh, in this very series, uh, Prokofiev wrote his first string quartet as a commission uh, for, the, for the Coolidge series in, in 1930. Uh, so this is a uh, really wonderful tradition here that I'm very happy to be part of. The uh, letters between Prokofiev and Kuzovitsky uh, are housed in the music division, and that was really an important source for me on tracing Prokofiev's career in America after he came here and worked with the Boston Symphony in the 1920s and 1930s. So um, anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here. Guten Abend, dobry vecher. So... Uh, this evening, yes, we're, we're having a German-Russian evening. Uh, historically, the Germans and Russians have not always gotten along that well, as, as you well know, particularly in uh, recent centuries. Uh, but musically, a uh, very, very close relationship. Uh, German music was a huge influence on the evolution of, of Russian music. Uh, many German musicians were imported to Imperial Russia, beginning back at the time of Peter the Great and onward, uh, to create a professionalized musical life in Russia. And many German composers, of course, visited Russia, and many Russian composers and writers lived in Germany, studied in Germany. Uh, so uh, obviously there's a very close connection. And there's several threads in the program tonight, the wonderful program of Beethoven, Schubert, Tchaikovsky, and Rachmaninoff. One is Goethe, uh, because actually nearly half of the songs that are going to be performed this evening are uh, settings of texts by Goethe. Uh, all of the Beethoven songs, all but one of the Schubert songs, and one of the Tchaikovsky songs, none but the Lonely Heart. Uh, so Goethe is one point of reference for the entire program. And another is actually Beethoven. 
Of course, we're hearing four songs of Beethoven. Uh, there's also a very unusual song by Rachmaninoff that you're going to be hearing this evening called Fate, Sudba, which uh, uses a, the opening motif from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, uh, which Rachmaninoff believed, as so many others have, that this is a uh, representation of fate. And there's even uh, some reference to Beethoven in one of the Schubert songs, An der Mond, uh, An den Mond, although I was speaking with David beforehand, uh, there's an introduction to one of the versions of that song that is a citation from the Moonlight Sonata, because it's a song about the moon. But in fact, it seems like that may have been a spurious addition later on. <laughs> it's not entirely clear. But anyway, Beethoven and Goethe are two touch points for this program. Um, as you know, the relationship between text and music is always a very uh, complex one. Uh, in many ways, a difficult marriage. <laughs> who, is, who is leading the text or the music, uh, as in opera? But of course, in the case of songs, uh, it's even more so because in opera we have the visual aspect, whereas with songs we have only the text and the setting. Um, and songs, as a serious concert uh, genre, uh, really didn't emerge until the early 19th century. Beethoven and Schubert, uh, Schubert were really the pioneers in this area. Russian uh, serious art songs came somewhat later, as I'll uh, describe a little bit more in detail in a moment, um, in the, uh, really in the 19th century, starting in the mid-19th century, and then Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff followed by Prokofiev Shostakovich in the Soviet era, wonderful uh, settings by composers like Svididov and, and others. Uh, but once again, it was really uh, Germany that led the way in many ways for what became of Russian songs. And um, how does the music illustrate the text? This is something we always are looking at when we listen to songs. Is it very uh, literal representation? In some cases, you will hear that in some of the songs this evening, like the representation of tears in uh, one of the Schubert songs. Uh, the spring flood, which I have named my uh, talk tonight, Spring Flood, which is actually the last song on the program. And you know, I, I just endured a Boston winter, so uh, it's, it's great to be thinking about spring. It's so lovely to be somewhere where there's actually some green and flowers. <laughs> um, and uh, this Rachmaninoff song is also about the joy of spring coming to Russia. And we know that this is a very important uh, topic in Russian music, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, and, and in many other works of literature and music in Russia, the coming of spring, the coming of Easter. And so, you know, all these songs, they tell stories. Uh, they're all kind of short stories. Some are very dramatic and actually describe dramatic action, like Schubert's song, uh, Erl Koenig. Others describe states of mind, uh, which I must say mostly are depressed. <laughs> uh, uh, in, there's, there's the song of the flea is one exception tonight. Uh, generally speaking, uh, most of the songs are in minor keys and they deal with themes like crying and loneliness and heartbreak and separation. <laughs> uh, and this is something Goethe, of course, was very good at. <laughs> Uh, and why would they turn to Goethe? Why did so many composers turn to Goethe? Well, of course, Goethe, and let me show you my next slide where I have the, uh, the composers. By the way, here we are, Beethoven. So we span 160 years uh, from Beethoven's birth to Rachmaninoff's death in Los Angeles in 1943. Uh, Schubert a little bit later, Tchaikovsky in the middle of the century, Rachmaninoff spanning two centuries and actually ending his career, of course, in, in the United States. And the poets, uh, there are actually, yeah, seven different poets. Goethe, the earliest of them, and the one to whom most of these, uh, for, on which most of these songs were based. Uh, one song by Vasily, uh, based on a poem by Vasily Zhukovsky, who was a court poet during uh, uh, the late 19th century and the early uh, late 18th and early 19th century in Russia. And then uh, some important romantic Russian poets, Tuchev, A.K. Tolstoy, not Leo, <laughs> related, but a different, a different fellow, who was primarily a playwright, actually, but also wrote poems. And Fiet, 
who wrote lots of poems about nature. Apukhtin, who was sort of a decadent poet, uh, not a very well-known figure, but his poems have been set by a number of Russian composers. Um, strange fact about Apukhtin is that he uh, suffered from incurable obesity and basically couldn't move. <laughs> sort of like the character in Oblomov, uh, if you know Goncharov's novel Oblomov. Midishkovsky, who was a symbolist poet, uh, and Rachmaninoff was very interested in the poems of Midishkovsky. Russian springtime, you see, snow. <laughs> uh, and um, of course, that was very true. I mean, any of you have been to Russia? I remember many springtimes in Russia, snow in May. And, uh, but it starts to happen, the water starts to melt, the snow starts to melt. That's, of course, the most important thing in the Rachmaninoff song, Visienlie Vode, uh, springtime waters. So let me tell you a little bit more about Schubert, Beethoven Schubert and then move on to, I want to focus a bit more on the uh, Russian songs. Uh, David actually asked me to do that because I think many of you are more familiar, particularly with the Schubert songs and the Beethoven songs, but maybe not so much with the Tchaikovsky songs and the uh, Rachmaninoff songs. Beethoven, um, he's not really known as a composer of songs. Uh, he did write quite a few. Uh, mainly based on te texts of Goethe, uh, although it was, after all, Beethoven who brought um, a chorus and song into the symphonic genre with his Ninth Symphony. Um, he's not especially known for creating melodies in, in song. He didn't like to present specific images in his music. He actually said, when sounds stir within, I always hear the full orchestra. I know what to expect of instrumentalists who are capable of almost everything. But with vocal compositions, I must always be asking myself, can this be sung? <laughs> so uh, he wasn't maybe a natural vocal composer, really, Beethoven. Also, um, uh, Goethe was not that happy with some of Beethoven's settings because he repeated, he would repeat lines and so on. And this is another big issue, of course, in the settings of poems by relatively well-known poets. And almost all composers of songs, Lieder, as we call them in German, Romancy in Russian, they did take liberties with the text and repeat uh, phrases, and you see this a great deal, particularly in Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky. There is some literal illustration of uh, feelings in the Beethoven songs, particularly in Vona der Wehmut, where the 30-second notes create the immediate image of tears flowing. So um, we're hearing four songs by Beethoven at the beginning. And then we're hearing eight by Schubert. Now, Franz Schubert, of course, was the one who really, uh, who really created uh, this leader repertoire. He wrote scores and scores of songs. Of course, he wrote other things too in a remarkably short lifetime. Um, but it was really Schubert who made songs a serious concert uh, genre. Before that, they were really kind of considered an amateur form, not really that serious. They were called maybe Hausmusik, uh, music of a rather low status. Schubert started writing songs very early in his career. He was only 17 when he wrote the wonderful song that concludes the first half, the Erl König, which tells this amazing story, kind of a fairy tale story of a father with a sick child on a horse a galloping, uh, and there's three different voices talking to each other. He was 17 when he wrote it. <laughs> so, in Schubert, we also see that the voice doesn't always carry the melody. There's a lot of interplay between the piano and the voice, and of course, that's a whole other aspect to consider in these songs. What's the role of the piano? How intrusive is it? Is it merely accompaniment, or does it become more active participant in telling the story? And I think especially you'll notice when we get to the Rachmaninoff songs, uh, the piano becomes much more important. Um, and after all, Rachmaninoff was a very uh, gifted virtuoso. 
so it's no surprise, and he often would accompany the singers uh, in the songs that he wrote. So it's not a surprise that the piano parts in the Rachmaninoff songs are often particularly uh, complex. Uh, in Spring Waters, uh, you see that, for example. Um, Schubert tried to convey this idea of immediate experience through music to represent the inner movement of experience in sound. Um, and most of his songs, there are also songs that deal with mythology here that we're going to be hearing uh, tonight with the passage of time. Many of them are quite uh, metaphorical. Um, and the Erlkönig, which ends the this, this Schubert uh, set. Now, let me talk more about uh, Russian songs and sort of the evolution of Russian romances. Uh, in his book uh, in 1896, uh, the Russian composer and critic Cesar Kui, who also wrote songs, stressed two points. The first was that in the Russian national tradition, the link between folk song and art song, which was called romance, romance, which came into the Russian language from Spanish, that the relationship between the folk, folk song and art song had always been particularly close. Now, of course, in uh, Schubert's songs, we also hear influence of folk song, uh, but it's more so in the Russian tradition. And this was quite conscious on the part of these uh, Russian composers, the members of the Mighty Handful, who believed that for Russian music to become distinctive, it needed to draw on Russian uh, folklore and folk tradition. So this is something we hear even in Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff, and certainly in songs by composers like Rimsky-Korsakov, Mussorgsky, uh, for example. Uh, so close connection between folk song an art song in the Russian tradition. Folk song Kui wrote was the cradle of the contemporary art song. When collective creativity passed into individual creativity and found expression in artistically refined and technically complete form. Secondly, Kui emphasized the unusual reverence felt by the, towards the text by Russian composers who tended more than their Western counterparts to regard poetry and music as equal partners. The word gives definite form to the feelings expressed, and the music strengthens this expression, providing sonic poetry that goes beyond what words can say. Both elements merge together and with doubled strength act upon the listener. And it was this organic unity of poetry and music that Kui saw as the ideal of the Russian romance, and one that he encouraged his colleagues in the group of composers known as the Mighty Handful, the Magucha Kuchka, Mussorgsky, Baradin, Balakirev, Rimsky-Korsakov, and Kui. This was their sort of uh, idea, their doctrine. By the time Kui wrote his book, there already had been 100 years of Russian songs. At first, this label, Romance, was applied to a vocal comp composition written by a Russian composer to a French text, with the French language, of course, being very much in vogue in Russia around uh, 1800, especially in Catherine's court. Lyrical songs with instrumental accompaniment, usually keyboard, and written to Russian texts were called something different, not romansi, but rasiskie piesni, Russian songs, rasiskie piesni. So by the early 19th century, as imported European culture became more completely integrated into Russian upper-class life, the term romance came to refer to songs set to Russian texts as well. So this was sort of the evolution. This tradition, which corresponds to the German Lied, also incorporated elements of the native Russian genre song, Bitavoy Romance, which is a kind of urban song, which was more popular and less sophisticated. As in many other areas of Russian musical life, it was Glinka who led the way in professionalizing the Russian romance, providing uh, numerous models for others to follow. The next generation was especially concerned with reflecting the smallest nuances of the text and preferred a declamatory style, closely following the contours of the language. And of course, the greatest practitioner of this style was Modest Mussorgsky, 
composer of Boris Godunov and other operas. Choosing vivid, often satirical texts that disturb, uh, deal with disturbing psychological and social issues, he produced a number of brilliant song cycles, including songs and dances of death. And uh, Mussorgsky's friend and collaborator Stasov wrote, what kind of romances are these? They are genuine scenes right out of major operas with broad and deeply gripping stories, complete with scenic interest and drama. At the opposite pole from Mussorgsky was Tchaikovsky. His many beautiful songs stand stylistically and emotionally much closer to the Western mainstream and the German lead tradition. Mussorgsky and Tchaikovsky did have a lot in common. Maybe that's why these two geniuses, Russia's greatest 19th century composers, couldn't stand each other. <laughs> Fated to be compared, thrown into social and musical competition in the glittering cultural arena of Tsarist St. Petersburg, they evolved into bitter rivals with radically different ideas about what Russian opera should be and song. Their relationship was not unlike the one between certain prima donnas, uh, Maria Callas and Renata Tebaldi come to mind, singing the same roles around the same time. Divas don't especially like to share the spotlight and neither do composers. In Mussorgsky's eyes, Tchaikovsky was pandering and insincere, his music too pretty and European. Mussorgsky even referred to Tchaikovsky by a mocking Turkish nickname, Sadik Pasha, this was the same nickname used by a notorious pro-Turkish Polish nationalist who also happened to be named Tchaikovsky. <laughs> For his part, Tchaikovsky found Mussorgsky, quote, coarse, crude, and rough, and dismissed his music as ugly and unrefined. <laughs> and they did uh, have very different careers. Uh, Tchaikovsky took a much more conventional path to musical success. In 1862, Tchaikovsky enrolled in Russia's first conservatory, the spanking new St. Petersburg Conservatory, and was a member of its first graduating class. Then he became a teacher at the recently opened Moscow Conservatory, which guaranteed a reliable income, and respectability, and networking possibilities. Mussorgsky, on the other hand, was famously disorganized, had a very uh, sporadic education, and drank himself to death. Uh, unfortunately. Although Tchaikovsky enjoyed La Dolce Vita, he clearly possessed better social skills and self-discipline than Mussorgsky. And Tchaikovsky shunned what he regarded as the confining Russian nationalism of the mighty handful. Instead, he embraced the more international identity of a, quote, European from Russia, to use the words of choreographer George Balanchine, one of Tchaikovsky's great admirers. In his songs, Tchaikovsky was influenced by such masters as uh, Schumann, particularly uh, in Germany, and his romances often resemble full-blown operatic arias. After all, remember Tchaikovsky wrote a, a number of very important operas, Eugene Onegin, The Queen of Spades, The Olanta, Mazeppa, and so on and so on. So um, he, obviously his operatic practice bled into his uh, work in songs as well and his songs tend to be more symphonically developed than Mussorgsky's. Building on the tradition of the popular Russian genre song, Tchaikovsky adds psychological depth and drama and became a model for another brilliant Russian composer of songs, Sergei Rachmaninov. Tchaikovsky, interestingly, did consider becoming an actor, and he was very concerned with conveying drama in his songs. Now, one has to say that uh, most of Tchaikovsky's songs are very sad. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about this one, Only the Lonely Heart, uh, which is based on a, 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 which is a setting of a Goethe poem. This is Tchaikovsky's most famous song by far, Nur wer die kent. It was translated into Russian by uh, May, and it comes from Goethe's novel, Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship. And it also exists in several instrumental arrangements. And if you've ever, if you follow scores, film scores for films about Russia, this song shows up in so many. <laughs> Very famously, actually, in Greta Garbo's Anna Karenina, 
where it's actually a, uh, a kind of a light motif, uh, this, this song. And it's used over and over again in Hollywood. Of course, uh, Tchaikovsky's songs and symphonies and even opera, operatic music was one of the prime sources for film composers, uh, particularly, particularly in the early years of, of, of Hollywood. Um, and, you know, Goethe, he was fantastically popular in Russia, by the way, as he was everywhere. You know, Goethe was really the sort of first best-selling author. Uh, his, his novel Werther was a, a global bestseller. Uh, Napoleon supposedly read it seven times, uh, and Lenin liked it. And uh, one of the things that's important about Werther and other Goethe writings, of course, is that he writes very much about the individuals uh, being isolated from society, an individual who cannot find his place in, in bourgeois society. Werther, of course, is all about a hopeless romance that Werther has for a woman who's married to someone else who's respectable and nice, but clearly not the man she loves. Uh, and he's, um, he, he suffers from... Uh, anguish over his position in society. And I think Tchaikovsky, who also had his own difficulties in establishing a happy uh, romantic life, he, he was gay at a time in Russia where it was really impossible to express that very openly. Uh, and he tends to very much uh, sympathize with characters who cannot find uh, love very happily, uh, like in The Queen of Spades or Eugene Onegin. And this song is all about suffering. <laughs> That's the word that keeps re being repeated over and over again in this song. Kakyastradal, kakyastradal, oh how much I suffered. Kakyastrajdu, how I am still suffering. Suffering, suffering, suffering. I love my suffering is basically what's happening here. Uh, and it's an interesting song musically as well because it has a kind of unusual off-center accompaniment. Uh, um, so here, let me play you actually two different versions. And of course, these songs, many of them uh, were written for one kind of voice, but they've been transposed for every voice you can imagine, <laughs> uh, and particularly in this case. And here I wanted to play you two different versions. One is by a baritone, like we're going to hear tonight, Nikolai Gyorov, and the other by a mezzo, Olga Baridina, who can also sing soprano. It's all about is love being far away, suffering, suffering, suffering. Ah, uh, uh, only one who's known longing to be together can know what I've suffered. Um, I, I was thinking about playing for you Frank Sinatra's version, but <laughs> I couldn't find a good recording. Maybe you've heard it, right? Uh, everybody has recorded this song <laughs> in every kind of language and every kind of uh, arrangement. Uh, so this is really uh, a good example of, of, of Tchaikovsky's songs in that it's all about a feeling. It's all about a feeling and conveying a feeling. And Tchaikovsky in all of his music was, of course, a great master at that in symphonies too. The emotion just comes across so strongly. But here, listen to a uh, different version sung by Olga Baridina.
Of course, having a mezzo singing a totally different color, uh, the gender idea is totally different, but it is a song that can be very easily sung. Of course, the, actually in Russian, the, the verbs are in masculine, kakya stradal, uh, not kakya stradala, but uh, she still sings uh, the original lyrics uh, from the point of view of, of, a, of a man's uh, voice. So th that's one of the best examples of uh, Tchaikovsky, but I wanted to also, he was capable of writing happier things. <laughs> and one of uh, a, a good example is this song, Don, Don Juan's Serenade, that we're going to be hearing also tonight. Um, and this comes from a poem by the uh, uh, Russian poet Alexei Tolstoy, who was actually kind of a, a friend of, of Tchaikovsky's. And it's a, a funny little song uh, with a very strong Spanish flavor. Um, about Don Juan and wooing various women in uh, Granada and, and elsewhere. Uh, Tchaikovsky loved Spain and Italy. He spent a lot of time there, like many other Russian composers. Glinka spent a lot of time in Spain. And you, we have Spanish Capriccio, Italian, uh, uh, Capriccio Italian, and so on. Lots of reference to Spain in, in Russian music, uh, generally speaking. Uh, but so here's this uh, Don Juan serenade. Um, Nightfall comes to the golden lands of distant Alpuyaras to the call of my guitar, come out my darling. And you'll hear this kind of Spanish flavor in, in the accompaniment particularly. <laughs> This is What he's doing is calling to a duel anybody who's going to come on to his girlfriend. <laughs> so, so as I said, uh, um, most of his songs are much more melancholy and are about feelings, but this is kind of a little scene, almost a kind of operatic uh, scene. The other two songs that we're hearing by Tchaikovsky, one is um, from a poem by Tchuchev, Kak nad gariache zole, as over the burning ashes. And it's, uh, Tchuchev was known as a philosophical poet, and it's a poem really about the creative process, a, a poet looking at a manuscript that's burning up in the fireplace, uh, and sort of saying, this manuscript is like me, my life burning away, and um, uh, my work which is not important. And then uh, the other song, At the Ball, a Sarid Shumna Vabala, also by Alexei Tolstoy. Um, it's a nice little sort of uh, uh, monologue of someone who's been at a party and seen a beautiful woman, and he's very struck with her, and he's saying, well, do I love her or not? I'm not sure, but I think I do. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's also an extremely popular song that has been recorded by many, many people that ends with this uh, kind of enigmatic, unanswered question. And Tchaikovsky did not believe that he should necessarily uh, just respect the, the poem as it was written. He often, he omits lines, he repeats lines, uh, he repeats uh, words, and he said, absolute accuracy of musical declamation is a negative quality, and its importance should not be exaggerated. What does the repetition of words, even of whole sentences, matter? Under the influence of strong emotion, a person repeats one and the same exclamation and sentence very often which is certainly true. Um, so poetic love, vivid grief, these are the main themes of Tchaikovsky's songs. Now, um, Rachmaninoff, who was, of course, younger than uh, Tchaikovsky and still alive when, uh, uh, Tchaikovsky was still alive when Rachmaninoff was starting out. Uh, Tchaikovsky encouraged Rachmaninoff a great deal. 
Um, and Rachmaninoff wrote uh, many, many uh, songs. Uh, outside Russia, we know him primarily for his solo piano music and symphonic works, the uh, Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini, which seems to be on the radio uh, all the time, uh, the three romantic symphonies, the cinematic symphonic dances. But for Russians, his extensive output as a composer of vocal music is no less beloved. I mean, he did write operas, uh, cantatas, liturgies, songs. Uh, a serious and passionate admirer, both of the possibilities of the singing voice and the dark and supple beauty of the Russian language, Rachmaninoff counted numerous singers among his closest friends and musical advisors. As a young man in his early 20s, he conducted at a small Moscow opera company where he worked with the legendary bass Fyodor Shalyapin. They too quickly became soulmates and lifelong friends and he wrote quite a few songs specifically for Shalyapin, of course, one of the greatest uh, basses who ever lived. And interesting that they both ended up in America where they had a lot to do with each other here too. And in his memoir, Shalyapin praised Rachmaninoff's understanding of the art of singing. With Rachmaninoff conducting or playing, the singer could be absolutely relaxed. He could reveal the spirit of the piece with subtle mastery. If a retard or pause were needed, he could provide it with exactly the right measure. When Rachmaninoff was accompanying me at the piano, I would have to say not I am singing, but we are singing, <laughs> which is a great tribute. So uh, Rachmaninoff uh, wrote um, something like 80, more than 80 songs for solo voice and piano. But interesting, he didn't write a single song after he left Russia in 1917. Uh, you may know Rachmaninoff fled uh, Bolshevik Russia. He had absolutely no sympathy for uh, the Bolsheviks or what he was assumed they would do to Russia. <laughs> and of course, he came from an aristocratic background. He was uh, just not part of that uh, scene at all. And he left going through Sweden. He lived in Europe, but then he really settled in America where he toured all over. And he ended up living actually in, in Beverly Hills. So for I think it's a very interesting fact that for Rachmaninoff, the language was so key. And somehow he couldn't find inspiration writing songs living in a non-Russian speaking place. So all of his 83 songs were actually composed before he, with he left. Before he left. Um, and these include um, uh, wonderful songs that have become extremely popular. Now, I think the one that's very unusual that you're going to hear tonight is this uh, song, Fate, Sudba, uh, which is to words of Apuchtin. Uh, and it also has the note, you know, inspired by Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, and this group of songs, the Opus 21, they are among the most uh, popular of all of Rachmaninoff's songs. Um, and they came actually from one of Rachmaninoff's rare, happy periods. <laughs> Stravinsky once described Rachmaninoff as, quote, a six and a half foot tall scowl. <laughs> and they both ended up in Los Angeles as neighbors, which is very interesting. Uh, so uh, finally, Rachmaninoff produced this kind of more or less uh, happier set of songs. Uh, and this, this song, Fate, I don't think you could call it happy, certainly, but it's very dramatic and, and different in that it um, tells a kind of story that has real social significance. And that's a little bit unusual for Rachmaninoff. This poem by Akhputin, is uh, it personifies fate as a woman going around knocking with her cane, and no matter who she meets, they have to succumb, whether they're poor or rich or in love or whatever, that there's no escaping fate. This also is a very Russian idea, sudba. We, are, are, we have to yield to our fate. There's nothing we can do about it. And what's very really interesting is how the, the opening of the song quotes from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which has all often been seen as um, a representation also of fate. So here's the opening bars of the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven, and then I'll play the opening of the song. <laughs> Oh, 
своими мрачными очами Судьба, как хвосты часовой Повсюду следует за нами Бедой лицой ее грозит Она в глазах посетела Она уж многих одолела И все стучит, и все стучит So this stuk stuk stuk, which is repeated throughout the song, the sound of the cane hitting the pavement, that's, that's fate announcing that, hey, you're not escaping me. Uh, so this was a song that often was sung by Shalyap, and here you heard it sung uh, by Elizabeth Sudistrom, who was a soprano. Uh, and this theme of fate is one that Rachmaninoff often uh, addressed in other works, uh, such as um, uh, The Gypsies, and his, which was the source for his opera Oleko, From the Fates There Is No Defense. It's the longest song that Rachmaninoff ever wrote, actually. Um, they once performed this song for Leo Tolstoy in 1900, and Tolstoy afterward was reported to have looked gloomy and cross, <laughs> uh, and called Rachmaninoff aside to tell him that Beethoven was nonsense. Remember, this is around the time that Tolstoy was writing um, his denunciation of just about everything in Western culture because it was decadent and not religious enough. Um, Rachmaninoff was annoyed by the remark and never saw Leo Tolstoy again, <laughs> even though he worshipped him as a writer. Rachmaninoff later told the other uh, Russian writer Anton Chekhov about the incident. Chekhov said, if Tolstoy had an upset stomach or was having an off day for some reason, he was apt to say stupid things. So, <laughs> so, but, so Rachmaninoff was very much part of this you know, cultural elite uh, at the turn of the century, this fantastic silver age of Russian culture. Uh, this explosion of poetry and art and ballet, of course, the beginnings of the Diaghilev Ballet Russe. Rachmaninoff came out of this uh, period and was very much part of it. Um, he, he was very nostalgic and homesick for Russia after he came to live in America. Uh, he often talked about that, and he did get in trouble for bad-mouthing the Bolsheviks uh, publicly, and he was never uh, allowed to go back to Russia, or actually he didn't really want to, but they wouldn't even play his music in Russia for a long time. And actually, I remember being in uh, the Soviet Union uh, with the, the Yale Russian Chorus. We were performing there, and we uh, went to hear another chorus perform something, and actually it was a Rachmaninoff, uh, part of the Rachmaninoff liturgy, but sung without words. <laughs> as a tone poem. Uh, they would do that sort of thing. So Rachmaninoff was on the wrong side of the political divide, you know, uh, after the Russian Revolution. So, now, uh, also, uh, the Rachmaninoff songs include this little song about the death of a bird <laughs> called On the Death of a Linnet. A linnet is a finch. Everybody always wants to know what is a linnet <laughs> in, when this song is performed. And this one was devoted, uh, dedicated to his first cousin. And she remembered when she was a girl, her mother took her to Red Square on Palm Sunday every year and bought her a siskin, a finch, in a cage which Olga would take care of until the warm days of late spring when they went out to the country and set the bird free. Sometimes the bird didn't fly away but perched on a nearby branch and sang a farewell song. When her siskin died in its cage one year, Rachmaninoff shared his cousin's grief. <laughs> and this song is about the, the devotion between a pair of finches <laughs> and, and the enduring power of, of love. And another interesting song you're going to hear is Christ is Risen. Rachmaninoff was very religious. Uh, he was uh, very uh, much part of Orthodox, Russian Orthodox tradition. He wrote a liturgy. He wrote a lot of other religious settings. And this is a poem, uh, a song based on a poem by uh, Mirish Klodsky, the symbolist poet. And uh, really what it's about is if Christ were alive today, he would be appalled at what he would see. <laughs> So once again, there's a kind of social message here. We don't really associate Rachmaninoff so much with social messages, but this song does seem to have one. It's a more philosophical poem. It throws an ironic light on Easter in order to shock the reader into seeing the truth about the world. And you'll hear these bell-like chords in the piano, uh, which seem to be an attempt to represent uh, church bells. 
which were such an important part of Russian life, bells. And you know, Rachmaninoff wrote a wonderful vocal cantata called The Bells. Yeah. Now, pardon? By Poe, exactly right, by Edgar Allan Poe, who was, by, by the way, extremely popular in Russia, with the, particularly at the end of the 19th century with the Russian symbolists, decadence. Now let me end with um, spring waters. This is a, uh, and it's a wonderful way to end this recital. <laughs> it's a very ecstatic, early Rachmaninoff song, uh, set to verses by the poet Tchuchif, Tuchif wrote a lot of poems about nature uh, with a kind of philosophical message, perhaps. Um, he wrote uh, this song to repay a debt. <laughs> Money that had not belonged to him was stolen from him on a train, and he wrote five songs to poems of Tuchif to, to make the money to pay it back. And in this poem, what's so interesting, it's Visiennie Vodli, uh, springtime waters. And in this poem, the thaw is heard as much as seen, the rushing waters. And I showed you that portrait earlier of uh, that painting of Russian spring where there's still a lot of snow around. <laughs> um, and what's also interesting about this song is that the piano part is extremely difficult and a very, um, I won't say aggressive, but it's certainly very, very present. Uh, it makes a very ecstatic impression and often is placed at the end of a recital or a recorded program. And the, uh, the words that um, are repeated are visna, visna idiot, visna idiot. Literally, spring is going, <laughs> spring is on the way, spring is coming. And uh, this, this poem, by the way, has been set by more than 30 composers. But this is by far the best known of, of them all. And the singer here is the Polish mezzo Ewa Podlesz, uh, who you may know. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful. piano part really sticks out at the end and uh, with these arpeggios and chords obviously the attempt to represent rushing waters and uh, the dynamism of spring actually it's, we see that right now don't we <laughs> so this seems like a good place to end thank you for your attention okay. and we do have a couple of minutes I think for questions yes yeah. David if, if you could just wait for a uh, microphone. Yep. 
Um, you mentioned Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky living in Hollywood at the same time. Did they have much interaction? They, they did meet each other occasionally. Stravinsky went to L.A. Uh, much earlier. You know, Stravinsky actually settled in Los Angeles around 1939. You know, he came, Stravinsky came first to America, and he came first to Boston, uh, but he said he couldn't stay in Boston because there were only two seasons there, the 4th of July and winter. <laughs> uh, so very, very quickly he, he moved to uh, Los Angeles where um, he stayed uh, until almost the end of his life and then he did move back to New York at the very end of his life. Rachmaninoff lived primarily in Europe uh, after leaving Russia in 1917. He was somewhat nomadic. He had a house in Switzerland. Uh, but then he made so much money touring America. He became very wealthy, Rachmaninoff, touring as a pianist, which was somewhat frustrating for him because he considered himself a composer. Uh, his uh, output as a composer declined radically after he came to America, but he did become very wealthy uh, as a virtuoso and also conducting sometimes, he, and he did have a close relationship with the Philadelphia Orchestra. But he didn't actually live, move to Los Angeles permanently until uh, early 1940s, and then he died soon after. He died in 1943. But he had a, he had a house up in the, uh, Beverly Hills, not far from where Stravinsky lived uh, just above Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> I just wanted to add, I've, I've read a bit of a story of how they encountered each other. Apparently, it was Stravinsky who reached out to Rachmaninoff, trying to invite him and his wife for dinner, but because their musical aesthetic was so different, he just wasn't sure what the reception would be. But apparently, through a mutual friend, was able to arrange this. And um, Stravinsky had heard that there was a particular kind of honey that Rachmaninoff was very fond of, so right. he arranged to have a jar of that right. waiting for him when he opened the door. Um, and I, I don't know if it was sort of by almost unspoken agreement, they didn't discuss each other's music. They spent the evening discussing the music business and their, their challenges and complaints and so on. <laughs> so, right. uh, yes, but, that's true. I heard the story about the honey, too. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Stravinsky, uh, although, you're, of course, their aesthetic was so profoundly different, uh, Stravinsky did have a great deal of respect for Rachmaninoff as one of the great men of Russian music. Yes. Has Rachmaninoff's music found its place in the modern Russian canon oh, now? Oh, absolutely. Unlike your experience in the Yale Russian Choir? Yes. Um, you know, it, especially since the end of the Soviet Union, even before that, uh, during the Glasnost period, you started to hear more and more Rachmaninoff, including a lot of his liturgical music. His symphonies are heard all the time. His operas are performed there also, some uh, certainly more than they are in the West. So yes, certainly he has found his, and Shalyapin, of course, also, you know, they've restored Shalyapin's house. They actually brought him back uh, to be buried in Russia. Uh, so a lot of these figures who were uh, on the wrong side of the revolution, they've been very much welcomed back in the fold. In fact, this is something that Putin has talked about a lot, you know, bringing back uh, the riches of Russian culture that were spread around the world after the Russian Revolution. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to make a follow-up comment. You said that uh, Rachmaninoff symphonies were even under Glushnoff's. That's not quite true, I don't believe, though, respectfully. I believe it was in 2003 that Yuri Temerankov Temer, Temer, uh, yeah. Yeah, first performed the symphonic dances uh -huh. in Petersburg with um, and I was, I was there with uh, Shostakovich's Babim Yar. Uh, well, that's interesting because the symphonic 2003, dances, yeah. I think that's true. The symphonic dances, after all, was a piece he wrote in America uh, and, for the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra. And his Orchestra. last piece. That's right. And then after he wrote that, he, uh, he moved, right. I believe, to, New, uh, to that's right. Beverly Hills. Yeah, so I think particularly the, the music that he did compose after leaving Russia, which was not a lot, but definitely uh, the symphonic dances was, was one of those. Yes, yeah. Rachmaninoff's music also, you know, speaking of Hollywood, uh, Rachmaninoff's music turns up all over the place in Hollywood movie scores, uh, sometimes stolen, sometimes copied, you know. <laughs> uh, Russian, uh, it's hard to know what uh, Hollywood would have done without Russian composers, actually, <laughs> uh, and including, uh, including uh, Shostakovich. <laughs> so we're out of time, but uh, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Robinson for helping us.